We'll start with Brock Dolman. He's um, coming from the Occidental, Arts the Occidental Arts and Ecology Center Permaculture Program up in Occidental, California, and the Water Institute. We'll also be joined by Lydia Nielsen. She lives down in Santa Cruz and owns Rehydrate the Earth Permaculture Design Company. Also, Spencer Smith came all the way in from Fort Bidwell, which if you're like me and you had no idea where that is, it's from the far northeastern corner of the state. And he's the owner of the Jefferson Center for Holistic Management. So welcome to the stage and we're excited to hear about your work. All right, how you feeling, soul? All right, all right. You guys have been here. Okay. Um, so you can see our title here. You've heard the order we're going to be in, which is I'm going to go first. Lydia's going to go next. Spence is going to wrap it up for us. And we're just going to cut to the chase here. I'm going to take those off. All right. All right. Um, I'm just going to get going here and move on to this next slide here, which hopefully comes up. I think I hit the right button. That was the button I was supposed to hit. All right, so how many people have been to Occidental Arts and Ecology Center in Western Sonoma County? Yay. For all the hands that aren't up, come and visit us. Um, have a look on our website. I won't elaborate much on OAC, but we're an 80-acre retreat center, organic farm. It's an intentional community. There's actually nine of us that co-own the land for the last 24 years as a consensus-based collective. And we got all kinds of programs and wonderful gardens and trainings and, and such. So come and visit us. So I'm going to mostly spend a, the bulk of my lead-in time here trying to just drop us into a a, more of a large-scale pattern, if you will, and I really just wanted to start on just acknowledging and honoring that basically y'all live on planet water. You don't live on planet Earth, and basically, right, the 70% the of the surface area of this planet is water. Even the little white clouds and the frozen tops of the mountains in that image there are all water. The green vegetation that you can see there is water, and this is an amazing water planet, and what's super cool about planet water is it's basically the only known place in the universe where life is endemic, which is kind of a big word, which is basically means occurs nowhere else. And if you can hook me up with an extraterrestrial, super fascinated to meet one as a biologist. Not, maybe there's one in the White House right now, I'm not sure, but um, I'm a biologist and I've been chasing life for a long time. And even as a three-year-old in the rice paddies in Japan while my dad was doing his third tour in Vietnam, you know, I've been, that's been the fascination. And as a kid, I just, basically made a profession of chasing tadpoles, and I'm an endangered species vertebrate biologist, which is how I get to regenerative relations with water and fire and permaculture, is trying to work with communities on trying to figure out how it is that we create conditions conducive for life on this planet that we live on. And so, for me, life is what I'm is the fundamental uh, inspiration, and, and I just want to uh, drop us in here to a little bit of chem mystery. It might be some mystery to y'all, but really just to focus or emphasize that when all is said and done, 96% of the tissues of all living things are basically some combination of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen there, which when I find myself when I see that, because otherwise this whole periodic chart of elements can be a little bit overwhelming. I don't know how many people bailed on OCHEM and inorganic chemistry, right? You're like, ah. Um, the fact is, what's really fun, is that when we think about, talk a lot about sustainability, and even more further than that, regenerative, I'm always interested in what is the question, which is really about the fact that there's two words are there. There's ability and sustain, and I'm interested in flipping those two over and begging the question, what are we striving to have the ability to sustain? And I think, as far as I can tell, as a biologist, it's really about the cycles of life. And so, Every human endeavor, if we can come up with ways in which we work with life and we engender resilience and regenerative capacity with the cycles upon which life depends, that's going to be a good, um, it's a good bet, if you will. Um, and so the fun part is, and to paraphrase a man named Jacques Cousteau, which people probably know, basically the water cycle and the life cycle are the same cycle. 
right? Because while we're carbon-based life forms by volume, all of y'all are mostly water. And so um, it may be a, an interesting notion that the, the younger you are, the more by volume water you are, and the older you get, the less water you are. And death is a function of dehydration for people and planets. And so I want to propose a toast so y'all stay hydrated right now. And drink up and stay hydrated because being low hydrated is a party foul. What's interesting then is also is, is thinking about the fire cycle and the life cycle. And when I think about fire, it's not just the big fires that we're having, these external combustion moments. It's about the fire of metabolism. It's about the fire of the sunlight on this planet. It's about the fire in your belly to get this work done. And, and so really honoring, the, I was thinking about where that word rekindling as kindling on a fire, but in there is kin. And the recognition, I'm a kinesthetic learner. How many people recognize or relate to the idea of kinesthetics, right? That learning by doing muscle memory. But you could also imagine that kinesthetics is, is about the aesthetics that you're kin with all of life and rekindling our right relations with all of life based on the water and the carbon cycle, I think are the primary entry points in. And so when I look at this image here and think about this big nuke plant up here called the sun, it's 93 million miles away, and it's sending down all that electromagnetic energy, some of which is hitting, say, the ocean and creating this process of the water cycle and the evaporation and condensation and coming down as a solid, a liquid, vapor in the fog cycle, surface water to the ocean, groundwater, evapotranspiration, and how we connect with the relationship of the water cycle and, again, the metabolism of the solar fire cycle is pretty fundamental. What's interesting is that the total volume of water on planet water is a fixed amount of water that has been so for pushing about 4.2 billion years. And so the noun of water, the thing of water, is a finite resource. But because it's a cycle, the verb of water is infinite. And that's the funny thing about water cycles and, those, and life cycles is that there's nouns and there's verbs if you're trying to, I'm engaging in this, the ecological literacy of reading the landscape and the flow in the system. And so really what we're really needing to check in with is how do we protect the quantity and quality of the noun by participating in the cyclical feedback loop of the water cycle, which is, I'm going to end on and set Lydia up to talk more about as well and then Spence as well on this. Fundamentally, right, the reality is, is that sunlight into sugar into soil is the cycle that we need for our salvation. And the fact that life, originally with bacteria, then algae, and then increasingly plants, have figured out how to turn sunlight into sugar into soil, that's one of the great cycles. The photosynthetic cycle is one of the great cycles. There's a lot of good ink in the room. I've seen a lot of it, really beautiful ink in the room. This is a really elegant use of some ink as far as I can tell. Six CO2 molecules plus six water molecules with sunlight into chlorophyll and out pops sugar and oxygen. That chemical formula right there is one of the greatest, greatest things of all. And you should definitely acknowledge that one because if that wasn't happening, y'all ain't here and life as we know it ain't here and would not have been here for the past 3.8 billion years since this has been happening. So connecting again to the water cycle and the carbon cycle to me, if you get those right, the other cycles will, will fill in. If, so if you're overwhelmed with trying to figure this stuff out, do what you can for the water cycle and the carbon cycle. And the beauty of the place where those come together is often typically in the realms of soil and the recognition that soil is a living ecosystem, right? There's the abiotic parts, the sand, silts, and clays, but then there's the presence of life and the photosynthetic organisms and the fungus and the bacteria and the worms and the roots and the breakdown and the decomposition that create this ama amazing uh, ecosystem we would call soil and carbon-rich soil. And that's a fundamental opportunity that I know a lot of the gist of this workshop of soil, not oil, which is not just a cheap little play on words, but is actually the case, right? The oligarchy of the fossil fools have been trying to get us to basically see dirt as dead versus soil as life. And you got to pick which uh, cycle you want to be on, the death cycle or the life cycle. Um, a lot of data out there, and we'll hear more about just the capacity. If you can increase the soil organic matter capacity, then the water holding capacity, the nutrient exchange capacity, the fecundity and resiliency of, of a living soil network is 
for us terrestrial dwellers of the other 29% of the planet that isn't out in the open ocean. This is the business end of where we get to interact, is the nexus of basically the fire cycle of sunlight and the water cycle into life cycles, and soil as a living ecosystem is our grand reservoir to engage that conversation in. I love this quote by Luna Leopold, who was a son of Aldo Leopold, if folks know Aldo Leopold's work, this idea that the health of our waters is the principal measure of how we live on the land. And so I'm often looking to water as a principal measure to evaluate the efficacy of human settlement in place through time. Is the quantity and quality of water better, cleaner, more abundant for your settlement there or not? It's a pretty straight up answer and water won't lie to you, it's super truthful. And so then I look at the planet and I kind of say, huh, maybe the health of the planet water is this principal measure of how well we've been doing living on the planet. And planets run in a fever, super clear. It's a fossil fuel fever foisted upon thee by the oligarchy. And, and right now this week is a whole lot about this climate summit and action and that. And I think the data is pretty clear out there. And, this is a, a succinct summary from 2013. But what I want you to point out is that every fundamental indicator of people like the IPCC uh, that um, talk about the recognition of that we have a process of a greenhouse effect leading to global warming, which is resulting in climate chaos or climate change, every one of the primary indicators is a water-based indicator. So the atmosphere warming is more water in the atmosphere, obviously ocean warming, the global water cycle, less snow and ice, mean sea level, it didn't say nice sea level, because when sea level comes up in your hood, it ain't fucking nice, it's mean, right? And climate extremes, and it's all basically pretty clearly dominantly on the human influence. Every fundamental indicator on the planet is a water-based indicator. It has to be, because you all know that when you melt an ice cube on your forehead, when you have a fever and it goes from a solid to a liquid, you feel cooler. And when you're sweating on a run, the liquid to vapor, you feel cooler. That process of melting from solid to liquid, liquid to vapor, is an endothermic reaction. It's a cooling reaction, and it should not surprise you that the endangered phase state of water on the planet is solid, because the planet's going to melt off all the solid it can to run a big global swamp cooler to try to break the fossil fuel fever, which is heading to liquid as the sea level's up, but the ocean's getting warmer, which is driving the cyclonic energy, right? And then this... Uh, this is just super straight physics, and I don't think it's that complicated. I swear that the water cycle is the opportunity. And if people know Null School, I don't know if people know that website, really fun. And you can go on there, it's real-time satellite data. And so I just loaded this up this morning, and this is just uh, the, the Hurricane Florence that's about to pummel the Carolinas there. And second on deck and third on deck, the bowling alley's happening. And it's the Atlantic is a little bit warmer than it normally is. And so it's not that hurricanes, they're natural. Did climate change cause them? No, climate change is amplifying the intensity of just making bigger, badder storms. And this has really been worked out, and I'll just, for the geeks who want to nerd out on it, go have a look-see at the work of anything that Jennifer Francis publishes. This is one of her seminal articles about this idea of the Arctic amplification. Less solid, more liquid, wiggly, crazy jet streams, and crazy jet streams end up in a crazy expression here on the West Coast, for instance, where imagine back in 2015, we were exceptional drought, extreme drought, and then how is it that two years later, we're quote, out of drought? And so this drought and deluge, just weather whiplash, this bipolar crazy making scene, which is what all the predictions are for where this planet is headed. And basically the, um, yeah, don't pray for rain if you can't take care of what you get. And that's a lot what we're gonna talk about is how do we, work with the landscapes and forests and rangelands and urban areas and homes so that when we get a bunch of rain, such as something called an atmospheric river, which are the big water cycles, people call the Pineapple Express here in California because there's warm water coming up out of Hawaii. And when we get slammed on, imagine this, this conveyor belt of vapor that comes from thousands of miles out can carry as much as 15 Mississippi rivers so we get 15 Mississippi rivers in a 50 mile wide punch in three days and then everybody's flooded out and the whole game is on and that's how we switch back and forth. And so how do we regeneratively, reverentially try to ameliorate the extremities in, in this, this behavior of how the planet's acting? And so a lot of us have been working on these ideas for a long time and 
sort of this phrase I made up years ago, the slow it, spread it, sink it, store it, share it, is one way where we think about the landscape as a sponge instead of running off. We want water to run on, to slow down, to spread out, to sink in the land, keep it around, recharge groundwater. If you really want to geek out in the peer-reviewed literature, you can actually have a look at this paper, which has a crazy long title, which I won't read, about summer base flows and decentralized water management, Mediterranean climate. Um, Coming up in May, or I mean November 7th and 9th, up in Groveland in near Yosemite, we're going to have our third year of this conference called Localizing California Waters. It's a whole series of organizations. We're deeply focused in working with policymakers, various governmental agencies, regulatory agencies, citizens groups, um, and we've got a bunch of working groups, policy working groups in the various waters the black, gray, rain, roof, storm, surface, ground, and then waterless toilets, compost toilets. And this is a bunch of get-or-done geeks who are really trying to legalize sustainability through policy change and general plan amendments and building code changes and that kind of work. A bunch of years ago, a number of us rewrote Chapter 16A of the California Uniform Plumbing Code so that laundry to landscape gray water systems are legal throughout California without a permit, right? Some of y'all got to figure out if that's the thing you do in your ecosystem, then step up to that plate and do that kind of work. And then you may want to help us bring back the beaver, because at some point we're ultimately wanting to connect with beavers. We have a whole <clears throat> poor little bear there. We got rid of the grizz for a little while in California. And then ultimately, if you want to ultimately have a look on our website at this idea I call Basins of Relations, which is really from ridgeline to river mouth, we're rekindling our right relations of all that we share within the basin of the, quote, watershed that we cohabitate in. And we're partnering with Totem Salmon here, who's speaking truth to power at the Board of Supervisors in Sonoma County. I can tell you if it's a hot day, you should wear shorts in Santa Rosa so you're not sweating while you're having a discussion there. And then, we're, and then really have a look-see at this whole arena of work called the biotic pump that's led to a number of folks like Mikkel Kravchik and others of this new water paradigm and their brand new website called Rain for Climate. And I think Lydia's going to talk about this a lot. And so we're moving from the big water cycles, such as they say the atmospheric rivers, into the smaller water cycles, which we can actually work with at watershed scales that are bioregionally appropriate and accessible to us. And so really what I want to leave you with is the whole notion that we want to receive and recharge and retain and release in a reverential rehydration rev retrofit for a revolution. And that's what I got for you people for today. Thank you very much. All right, hi everyone. I'm Lydia Nielsen. I'm from Santa Cruz. I have a company there called Rehydrate the Earth. I do permaculture education and design. I've been focusing on small-scale residential properties for the last five or so years, uh, about a half acre and smaller, although I do have a couple of larger projects. Um, and the, initially I thought, oh, I, I, this isn't doing anything. You know, I want to go work in places like John Liu and Darren Doherty and Jeff Lott and all these guys, you know, do this big work. But um, I've actually found that the impact of working with the majority middle class in suburban areas is really quite powerful. There's a lot of people who want to do something, want to try to make a difference, and don't really know how to sink their teeth in. And so what I work on is helping those people infiltrate their gray water and their storm water and their rain water off their roofs into their landscapes in order to sustain perennial vegetation, which then contributes to this small water cycle that Brock mentioned, and I'm going to get into that some more. So my goals in my company, Rehydrate the Earth, um, I want to plant water, keep trees, grow rain, right? So I like the kind of unusual combination of words here. We're usually thinking about planting trees, you know, but now we're planting water. So we plant the water in the earth so the trees can draw it out of the earth, so the trees can release it into the atmosphere so that it can become rain again and fall back down on the earth and move further inland. So, um, yeah, let me run through these points and then I've got some more details to cover here. So the, the whole idea here is rehydrate the earth. How do we do it? We increase surface permeability and thereby water infiltration and underground storage. So what we have developed over the last 100 years with our water management strategies is a largely impermeable earth surface where even if it's dirt, it's so compacted, it's so devoid of carbon and air spaces that water won't sink into it. So when it rains, we get lots and lots of water runoff, lots of water in this, into the streets, into the storm drains, out into the ocean right away. And the landscape itself, the land, the continent masses are dehydrating. So 
you know, we talk about sea level rise, oh, it's because the ice caps are melting, the glaciers are melting, but, you know, if more water is going into the ocean than is coming out of the ocean and going back on the land and being held in the land, we're going to have sea level rise. There's no other way about it. You do some math, you see that. So the, um, after you have increased the surface permeability and you've got some water being stored in the earth again, you can grow way more stuff. You can revegetate in a very vital and vibrant way. So primarily trees are the main source of this stabilizing, water recycling. They have their roots, they drop all this organic matter, it decomposes, it's like carbon rich, it's habitat, it's food, it's shade, it's shelter, it's all this stuff. Trees are just amazing, as you know and they change the soil. They change the soil so that there's way more of a biotic community going in there, more diversity, more organisms, eating, pooping, reproducing, doing their thing, holding water in their bodies, holding nutrients in their bodies, holding carbon in their bodies, really transforming the soil. Um, once we have transformed that soil, we have the capacity to hold water and carbon on the landscape, in the earth. So, you know, we've got like, lots of carbon in the atmosphere and lots of water in the ocean. And what we want is the carbon and the water back in the land. So these are like overarching goals to hold on to. So once we're getting more water and carbon in the earth, we can sustain uh, a more vibrant, more complex, multi-level perennial vegetative system. We improve that soil health and all those plants then are healthier. So then the food that we eat is healthier. The trees are healthier. The trees contain more moisture in their tissues and they're less prone to ignition. So really nice if the trees don't burn quite so easily. Um, another great gift that the plants give us is that they cool surfaces and reduce local temperatures in a variety of ways, not just through shade. So shade, you know, yeah, you can put up an umbrella, you can put up an awning, but the way that a tree provides shade or provides this cooling is via this mechanism that Brock mentioned with the phase change. So when you have trees that have access to underground water and they're able to take that water up into their roots, they bring it through their bodies and then they release it through their leaves. So you may be familiar with this term evapotranspiration. It's a combo term, evaporation, which is just straight up liquid water turning into water vapor, consuming heat as it does that, right? Solar radiation provides the energy for liquid water to turn into water vapor. But then the trees are also breathing, exhaling water out of their leaves. So the undersides of a tree's leaf is full of little holes called stomata. And in order to photosynthesize, they have to open those stomata to take in carbon dioxide, and then they breathe out the oxygen and the water vapor. So if it's too windy, plants will close down those stomata. They will stop photosynthesizing because it's too windy, and they can't afford to lose that much water. So if you are growing crops or trying to produce some kind of food in a really windy area, you'll notice that high winds produce very low yields. So, um, you know, a lot of this climate stabilization thing has multiple layers and can be very subtle. But so as the trees are transpiring this water, they are using that solar radiation and turning it into vapor instead of turning it into sensible heat. So what that means is that the area feels cooler. Your experience of being somewhere is of being cooler. So a tree is not just straight up shade. It's like all of this leaf, leaf surface adding up to thousands of hectares of leaf surface of evapotranspiration, water vapor moving into the sky. Um, all right, we also stabilize water patterns through this biotic pump that Brock mentioned, and I'm going to get more into that in a minute and just get through here. Slow sea level rise, I already mentioned that, and reduce the atmospheric CO2 by sequestering in soil and plants. And that point has been addressed by numerous people already here today. But the whole point here is that if we can get more water into the landscape, the plants will grow and the plants will draw that carbon out of the atmosphere and hold it into their, in their bodies and in the soil. Okay, so here we have a little quickie of the hydrologic cycle, which I'm sure you've seen before. This one is from... Um, I brought the book. Where did I put it? Victor Schauberger, sorry. <laughs> Victor Schauberger. So the book Hidden Nature was translated, it's, it's written by Alec Bartholomew, but it's about Victor Schauberger. Victor Schauberger was a forest warden in Austria in the late 1800s. And he had some very different ways of looking at the natural world. He spent a lot of time out in nature at night in very remote, untouched areas of wilderness and just observing what happens with water and weather patterns and vegetation and land in these undisturbed areas. And so... I just want to draw your attention in this diagram here that 
the evaporation that comes off of the ocean is different than the evapotranspiration that comes off of the forest. So this is very raw water vapor that comes out of the ocean. It's pretty clean. The evapotranspiration off of the forests is full of stuff. It's full of pollen and bacteria and little fungal spores and dusts and little bits of decaying organic matter because you have this multi-layered, very complex biological system with all different kinds of organisms living in there. So why this is so important is that this water vapor rising off of the forest has a very different quality than the water vapor rising off of the ocean. Now, Victor Schauberger said over 100 years ago that if we continue with the deforestation that was happening over 100 years ago, we were going to end up with global climate change, including much more violent storms, flooding and drought, high winds, really intense storm events, and things not spread out evenly, things not, you know, rain not happening over the whole continent, but happening only on the coasts, storms not happening, you know, at one time of year, but happening, you know, sporadically at very different times of year, patterns being disrupted. Um, so when you have the evapotranspiration from the trees, and it's very complex and it has all these other things in the vapor, it behaves much more differently. That um, the bacteria that can be in that water vapor actually allows water vapor to condense and fall back down as rain much more readily than the, they call these condensation nuclei or cloud seeds. Has anybody heard this term, cloud seed? Super cool idea, right? That the water vapor up in the atmosphere, it doesn't just gather all together and drop of its own accord, it gathers around something. So the government has experimented with spraying different kinds of things into the atmosphere to induce this process, but the best way to get water vapor to condense is to have it pass through a forest so that you have the, the pollen, the bacteria, the fungal spores, all of this stuff. So in particular, there are certain kinds of bacteria that live in the stomata, right? In the pores, on the undersides of the leaves, that leave the tree with the water vapor and rise up into the atmosphere. And they are really good at gathering this water vapor and helping it condense and get heavy enough to fall back down as rain. So what happens when you have water vapor from the forest is that it's able to condense at a much higher temperature. Right, so what, in the absence of all this foresty stuff, what induces the water vapor to fall as rain? Well, once it gets high enough, it cools off. Cooling induces condensation. And then also it compresses. So there's more water vapor per unit of area when it condenses, right? So in this large global water cycle, that can take a long time. This water vapor can go very, very high and travel very far from where it evaporated before it falls back down as rain. But in a continuous forested area, that water vapor rises up, condenses very quickly at a low altitude, at a higher temperature around these bacterial cloud seeds. And then the water is falling very close to where it was drunk by the trees and breathed out. So in this way, we're able to use forests in order to get uh, rain to happen close to where we're doing our restoration projects, right? It's not like we're doing this project here and then thousands of miles away somebody's going to get rain. It's like we're doing this project here and we're going to get rain within a few miles of where we're doing this. So <clears throat> we have this enormous potential then to infiltrate water into the landscape, plant trees, and induce the formation of rain very close to home. So what happens then on a larger scale is that water vapor leapfrogs from the coastal regions to the inland regions, creating a very stable, very balanced, extending far inland weather patterns where the rain keeps moving inland. So here you see, this is from um, Bill Mollison Designer's Manual from a project in Brazil. But you see, you have moisture-laden water vapor coming off the ocean, and as it encounters the forested areas, multiple things are happening. So some of that water vapor is being filtered through the trees and condensing actually on those leaves and dripping down, like not as precipitation, just straight up condensation. But then a lot of that air is being pushed up and over and condensing and mixing with the vapor that's coming off the forest themselves. And so there's this condensing of rain on the condensation nuclei and then the falling of the rain and then the drinking of the water by the trees and the re-releasing of the rain and the moving just a little bit further inland and falling again and so you have this beautiful spiraling pattern 
Now for years, you know, people have been talking about wind patterns and how, oh, the reason why we have these onshore breezes is because it gets hot inland and the hot air rises and it draws in the cool moist air off the ocean. But new research indicates that it's not just about these temperature differentials. It's actually that the condensation of rain creates a low pressure zone that pulls in more of that water vapor. And this is this biotic pump theory. So the vegetation itself is providing a sucking that brings the moisture-laden air in and creates this pulsing of rain that goes further and further inland. As you deforest these zones, you lose that water, you lose that draw of moist ocean air coming inland, 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 and it's very, very hard to restore spontaneously. So that's why the work that Brock is doing and Spencer is doing and all the people who are working with the holistic grazing and getting more water into the earth and the little projects that I'm working on with gray water and stormwater infiltration on small properties, this is so essential. We have to get water back into the earth in order to grow trees again, in order to set this cycle back up. And the big question that I'm playing with is how many trees do we need and in what orientation do we need them to be in order to reinstate this drawing, this biotic pump? So I did not start my timer. Miguel, are you here? Does anybody know how much time I have left? <laughs> no? OK. All right. So um, yeah, so here's the macro scale. But on a micro scale, the way that a tree interacts with rain is just so amazing. And there's all these things that I feel like, you know, we sh you should learn this in kindergarten. And now you can't even get it with a PhD. You're not even being taught this stuff, right? So how does a tree interact with rain? Let's see if I can use a pointer. Yeah, OK. OK. So the tree does so many things. So first of all, as the rain is falling down, these raindrops are falling hard. They can be like 30 kilometers an hour, pounding the earth. When a raindrop hits the earth that fast, it breaks apart the soil structure. And so soil, if you've seen nice, healthy soil, a lot of you are like earthy people. It's, it's clumpy, there's aggregates, there's different sized particles and they're all stuck together. And they're stuck together by the gooey secretions of the microbes that live and move through them. So it's held together in this really nice way that leaves open spaces. And these spaces are for air and for water to move down and move up so that the soil itself can breathe. So the leaf canopy of a tree intercepts that high speed raindrop and absorbs that kinetic energy by moving. So the raindrops fall, the leaf bounces. Ah, now the raindrop is just gonna plop off onto the earth. So super important. Okay, also we have the condensation and interception that I mentioned before. So all these leaf surfaces, they cool off and moist air comes and hits a cool leaf surface and that cold triggers the condensation of that water vapor and it turns liquid and it drips down, so cool. And also condensation, so evaporation uses heat. Evaporation is a cooling process, right? Condensation is a warming process. So when moist air passes through the canopy of the tree, it actually warms things up a little bit. And when moist air evaporates from the canopy of the tree, it cools things off. So trees are like balancing everything out, keeping it all stable. Then the third point at the top there is the transpiration and evaporation, which we mentioned extensively already. So fog and moist air are condensed. Okay, then there's the through fall. The rain is coming through the canopy. It's picking up all these nutrients, bug poop and dust and all the different microbes that are in the upper canopy and carrying them down to the soil where they either get eaten by somebody or they stimulate another wave of microbial activity. Um, the nutrients in solution can feed other organisms growing on the tree, in the tree, on the bark, on the surface, below the surface, etc. Moisture is held in the crown and the air mass within the canopy of the tree, creating a really nice environment, right? It's nice to have trees around your house. It's nice to be under trees. But one thing that I'm really noticing when you think about the forests that we have left, and like a lot of them are really pretty dense, and um, people don't want so much, most people don't want so much to be in a super dense tree canopy. We feel really closed in. We'd like to be able to see further. So this idea of like opening up land, letting some sun in so we can build our houses, so we can have a sunny field, so we can grow our crops. Like it's a thing, you can see where it came from evolutionarily, but it's something that we actually have to adjust our thinking about. We have to get more excited about denser tree canopies so that we can love the landscape that we need to recreate. 
Um, we also need to get more into like messy landscapes and <laughs> things like that. So, you know, we have our, our aesthetic. Humans have our aesthetic and, and it needs to tweak a little bit. Um, anyway, moving on with the trees interaction with rain, um, water being channeled all kinds of places, water being channeled off the edge of the canopy, uh, the drip zone dripping down there, water coming down the trunk of the tree, water going into the earth. Once it's in the earth, it's being filtered and cleaned by the physical soil itself, by the microorganisms in the soil. It's percolating downward. It's being drunken up by these roots to be re-evapotranspired to create these waves of rain. Um, it's bound on soil, bound in, on the soil particles. And so that, that microscopic film of water on soil particles is what sustains the trees through the late dry season. You know, you dig in the soil, you're not, you're not feeling a lot of moisture. But deep down in there, those roots are able to use that water that's in such a fine film that we don't even notice it. There's all these fungal mycorrhizae that are holding things together, communicating, passing water from trees to trees, between species, interspecies, etc. Um, and then there's the through flow that's going down to the groundwater, to the aquifers, and then eventually making its way to the streams and back to the ocean. So if we want to keep water on land, we're fighting gravity. Fighting, it's, it's going to go downhill. It's going to go into the ocean. This biotic pump is pulling this water vapor back on land, and it rains, and it comes down, and it flows back into the ocean. And we have to participate fully in this cycle and figure out how to hold the water on the landscape in order to rehydrate our land masses instead of just raising the sea level. So, let's see. Okay, so the main technique that I use in my small-scale restoration work is uh, swales and berms, and then also just infiltration basins. And these are so easy to put together. So you can see here in the diagram, a little cartoon, not ever how it actually looks, but gives you a really great idea. Like you dig a trench on the level, on the contour, and water runs into it. When you dig through that top layer, you dig through the impermeable blockages that have built up from those broken apart soil particles that then filtered down through the bigger soil particles and formed an impermeable layer, like somewhere between six inches and 18 inches below the soil surface. You break into that, you fill that trench with organic matter. I use a lot of wood chips, anything that came, like any organic debris you can fill these trenches with. You're keeping them cool. You're, you're providing water and organic matter and cool temperatures to a deeper layer of soil where the soil microorganisms can then just go crazy. They have food, they have water, they have shelter, they have what they need. And so this jump starts your whole soil microbiota and then provides these, um, builds up over time, these lenses of saturated soil that the trees that you plant on the berm, so the berm being the soil that you took out of the trench and piled up a little bit downhill, the trees there, they have like great, nice drainage from being on a slight mound, but they can access this subterranean water. So this is how you set up, like infiltrate the water, put it in the earth, feed the trees, the trees transpire, the vapor comes back up, the vapor condenses, the vapor rains back down again into another swale, goes back into the earth, gets drunk up by more trees. So this whole, um, this whole process can be done on a larger scale, but I've been working with it on a small scale, just shovels and wheelbarrows and people and wood chips and, and the, the extra magic of working in, in residential neighborhoods is that there's gray water so easily available, like everybody's washing machines and bathtubs and showers, super easy to plumb out of the house and into these same water features in order to provide water to the landscape when it's not raining. So this is a way that we can be rehydrating the earth with our lightly used water and doing it all season long. And it, usually a pretty regular amount of water is produced by the same family in the same place over the year. So this is a really great way to provide that consistent water source. So also then, we're adding carbon and compost and feeding the whole cycle, and it's that carbon and compost, increasing the carbon in the soil, holding on to nutrients, really feeding and nourishing the biotic community that's going on. And, um, and it's, it's just beautiful and fun and um, really, really doable. So I, have, um, I do a lot of courses. I do a lot of permaculture courses. I have some flyers up here for some upcoming classes. And um, we've got a, a site in Soquel, which is just a little bit south of Santa Cruz, where we're doing a lot of tree planting and experimenting with different ways of growing crops and um, just really having a lot of fun playing. And so we're going to be having volunteer days and classes there. So if you're interested in any of that, there's some flyers down here. And I think now I'll pass it over to Spencer. Started the Jefferson Center for Holistic Management because we have a different problem where I live. 
I live in rural California where our population boom is more of a bust. Our communities in the parts of the world that grow a lot of the food that feeds the rest of us are really drying up and blowing away. To the point that the school where my, my daughter goes, when I graduated there was 14 of us in my graduating class. This year we graduated two seniors. We're combining all the classes and we're trying to keep the doors open because the next school available to us is 45 miles away and over a summit that's close to 7,000 feet and, and not passable in the wintertime in a school bus generally. It's very important for me that everybody realizes the connections between the decisions that we make, not just as consumers but as parts of this ecosystem. For there is only one ecosystem. There's not an ocean ecosystem and a terrestrial ecosystem and a soil ecosystem. We are all very much connected. And that's what holistic management is. We travel around the world um, helping, <coughs> excuse me, land managers, farmers, ranchers, um, real estate investment groups, NGOs and governments develop regenerative land planning and yeah, sorry, bro. I'm a pacer. I get nervous if I get stuff behind a hole like that. Um, developing programs in which they can grow their biome and enrich their environment to save more water, produce more food, and at the end of the day, enhance their local communities. Um, like, that's enough about that. So we, the, the part of my, my speech is, is wildfire and water and how those things interact in the California e, um, biome and, and what's really happening and why we should be concerned is why we and why we as individuals need to take action. Because as much as I would like to be able to blame someone or something, be it a Republican or a Democrat or a capitalist pig or a, a corporation for where we are, it is our fault, yours and mine, that our environment is degrading at record speed. Because largely, as a human race, we have removed ourselves from the environment. We find ourselves separate from the biome in which we live, and that causes all kinds of problems. Now this is you know, mostly a first world issue. I work a lot with with tribes in, in Nevada and you know, indigenous folks from around the world. And the idea of um, a wildlife area or, a, or a, an area that people are forbidden to go into is completely crazy. Because at what point did people become separate from the environment? Are we not shapers of the environment that we live in? Do we not create and interact with our food system, with our water cycle, our carbon cycle, energy flow community dynamics in the mineral cycle every single day, every time we take a breath? I think that we do. And I think the sooner that we can reconnect with our natural systems, the better off we'll all be. Because the health of the, of the environment and the health of the population are very much connected. So I do travel around a bit, and uh, I think I might have spoke a little bit ahead of my, my slide here. Um, this is the Sahel region of Africa. I was there in June um, de working with some, some pastoralists and some farmers for an NGO back there. And one of the things that they're worried about or that, deal, that, they're, that they're dealing with is that the rainy season comes later and later every year. The message that the government was telling the American farmer all of a sudden, we had an excess of wheat that we could no longer sell. We went into a recession similar to this last one in the early 80s. Agriculture was hit very deeply by that. Um, and in order to get out of that, Ronald Reagan started to cut trees to pay for the national debt. Right? So I don't know if anybody remembers what logging looked like in the Reagan administration, but it was largely clear cutting went through and overutilized the resource in our national forests to the point that the pendulum swung the other way and the next administrations said, no, we've got to have a hands-off approach. So we went from 
extracting from our natural environment to now it's a hands-off and we've very much limited how much interaction we have with forestry and the agroecological um, systems in our wildlands to the point that we have suppressed fire and created an overabundant tinderbox that's burning all the time. So we can't be extractive and we can't be delinquent in our natural resources, right? We as human beings are part of the ecosystem and we have altered it to the point where now we need to continue to manage and we need to manage for a healthy water cycle. When we don't, fuel loads pile up and people die. In 2017, in one week, 44 people died in fires. This year, people are dying in fires. This winter, people will die in landslides. I'm almost sure of it because as sure as I'm standing here, the rain will fall this winter. And when it falls, it'll fall all at once. Erosion's gonna happen. We're gonna have mud going into our streams. Those streams are gonna get silted. We're gonna have problems with habitat. Water's gonna go underneath the pink bridge. And in the meantime, we are not only losing our, our natural resources, but human life as well. AccuWeather has come up with a number that says that the 2000 fire season in California will cost $180 billion. That'll pay for a lot of fast trains that a governor could put his name on, right? What if we had taken that same money and put it into creating a resilient forest system? Now, per acre, that's about $4,700 per acre, but not all acres, now this is public land acres in California, need this type of attention. So we could spend a considerable amount of money to try and turn that back around and create a system that is regenerative instead of extractive or allowing things to um, oxidize and, and nutrients and, and benefits to, to go up in smoke or air. <clears throat> so as those raindrops fall, they fall about 30 miles an hour, as we, we just learned, and carries a dramatic amount of, uh, of sediment and silt along with it. That silt goes a long way. One thing um, that maybe not a lot of folks realize is that pine trees bioaccumulate lead pretty darn well. All plants have the ability to take up nutrients into their system. That's how they get mineralized and that's where our nutrients come from, but not all elements are beneficial to our survival, right? All, all our different species evolved a little bit differently. When we take a look at what that looks like after a tree burns, if anybody remembers from biology, the difference between like vitamins and minerals is that you cannot get rid of a mineral by burning it, right? So when the ash and the smoke goes up into the air, all those toxins, all those heavy metals are left in the ash. When the rain falls and that ash and that sediment is drawn into our waterways, that water then goes into our streams and tributaries and is left toxic, killing the trout. Now, if you're in this part of California, largely you're drinking water that's coming out of these areas that are burning right now. Luckily, over the years, California has realized that the water that y'all are drinking is largely toxic anyway, and so it's going through a hellacious treatment process. Thank goodness. Question I have is, what do we do with the toxins that are coming out of the water anyway? We gotta put them somewhere. Next question I've got, who's filtering the irrigation water on the crops that we eat? Has anybody looked at what heavy metal toxicity is doing in our food system? Has anybody looked at the loss of nutrient density in our food system? So we're getting toxicities and loss of nutrient densities? That's a lot of sicities. We can address this by managing for holes, by understanding that we are all connected. The food system, the carbon cycle, the water cycle, all of humanity is connected through this energy that is our environment. And until we realize that, we're gonna be in trouble. 
Building resiliency into our system, it's not difficult. We need to manage for four things. Anywhere in the world, landscapes and ecological health are functioning off four main principles. The water cycle, energy flow, community dynamics, and the mineral cycle. If we, on every inch of arable soil in California, manage to maximize those four things, we can create resiliency, nutrient density, clean water, and health throughout our population. If we continue to extract, we'll continue to see massive fires, burn massive swaths of our real estate, creating more toxicity in our streams. This is what healthy soil looks like. We want that good black cottage cheese. We want that ped structure and that sheen on it. This soil is not just healthy soil, it's my soil. What matters about that is the people that I work with live on the land that they farm. Whether it's pastoral communities in West Africa, folks in Costa Rica, Mexico, or North America, the people that farm where they live, the family farmers, no matter if they're farming a couple hundred thousand acres or a hectare, you cannot remove them from that landscape. When you grow food and you, you manage for the health of, of your farm, you become connected to it. That's why we see so much depression, so much suicide in American agriculture. Did, who knows the highest rate of um, suicide by occupation in the US? Dairy farmers, right? Because they've so commoditized their livelihood that they are losing their farm, and their farm is their sense of self, and you cannot remove that from a person that's connected to space without having a severe dramatic break. We are connected to our food system. The people are all connected, whether or not you're a producer or a consumer. We need to manage for wealth and, as Brock said, fecundity throughout. A little bit about the water cycle. I was, I was driving from Chico, California to uh, Red Bluff a couple years ago. I was meeting with Cindy Daly, who I think spoke here on the first day, and she's absolutely brilliant, the leader of the Regenerative um, Agriculture Initiative at Chico State. And if y'all need a resource about regenerative agriculture, she's it, and, and the Regenerative Ag Initiative is, is definitely it as well. But anyway, I had to pull over on Highway 99 and suffered a, a rear end accident and several you know, middle fingers to do so to get this picture for y'all today. These two orchards are directly across the highway from each other. Same tree variety, same rainfall, same minute I took that picture. The only difference is management. The farmer on your left He's a good farmer. He wakes up in the morning and he does the work that the UC Extension office says you need to do when you're a nut farmer. And he either sprays the understory, he mows the understory, or he does both of his orchard in order to make sure that he doesn't get pests and disease in his crop. The other guy, he farms like me. He likes coffee in the morning. Maybe he's got some thinking to do, some other paperwork, and he doesn't necessarily get up in the morning with the direct idea of killing the understory of that, that orchard. What we're looking there is just common wild oats, fillery, you know, just, just life on the other side of that. And with that, we're also looking at an intact water cycle. Here we see massive erosion over land flow and piles up of debris. Mineral cycles broken, water cycles broken, community dynamics are broken, and energy flow is also suffering. The picture I should have got, but I drove past, and like I say, it was a busy road. The low spot, both of these have been leveled orchards, but nothing, nothing's ever plum level. Uh oh, three minutes. Um, 
the, the bottom end of that field, there's probably four or five acres that was underwater. The next time I drove through that orchard, maybe, or drove up 99, maybe a couple months later, there was a bunch of trees that had tipped over in a windstorm. So this guy's got an intact water cycle. This other fellow's got sprinklers. At the end of the day, one guy's producing nuts and more profit per acre than another. And I'd venture to guess it was the one that was working with nature. Whether or not it was intentional remains to be seen, I guess. So the focus of this talk is that it's just not water under the bridge, right? This is the financial capital of the Western United States. What happens in San Francisco ripples dramatically throughout the West and throughout the United States. We need to change our tone. We need to change the rhetoric and we need to not blame climate change or flood or drought. We need to acknowledge that each one of us as individuals is either creating resilience or not. We need to acknowledge that if we suffer a terrible drought, it's because we created a landscape that won't take water. If we suffer an incredible flood, it's because we created a landscape that won't take water. If our watershed functioned as it should, the snow would still fall in the winter, and it would melt and it would enter through that porosity, that black cottage cheese. It would trickle down and be purified. It would go into the aquifers, the streams would then recharge, and in April we wouldn't have high flow, as high a flow of water, we'd still have high flow. And in August we wouldn't have dry riverbeds and creeks and streams. Rather, our groundwater system would be able to constantly moderate how it released those waters through springs, into tributaries and creeks, into the rivers, and we would constantly have more resilience and more sustainability in our people and in our landscapes. So maybe a couple years ago when y'all weren't flushing the toilet during the worst drought, maybe that was penance for mismanagement, not your mismanagement, all of our mismanagement of our California watershed. Thank you. <laughs> Pretty depressing, right? I'll say something since there's no questions in this moment. I, I really want to say that the focus on carbon, um, you know, I've been, I've been reading about this stuff for years, and the Rain for Climate guys that, um, that Brock showed the slide about, they, they've, they've put forth this idea. Is it the carbon in the atmosphere that is causing climate change, or is this just an indicator and, and like an easy thing that we can measure? Because actually it's our land management strategies that are causing global climate change, and it's deforestation that's disrupting the water cycle that is causing global climate change, and carbon is just the thing that we have fixated on. So I think that's an important lens to just bear in mind. Water is the principal measure of how we live on the land? Yes. Luna Leopold. So her question is about biochar, and that some research has shown that it doesn't work unless you um, inoculate it with, inoculate it. with nutrients. So yeah. You didn't to make the biochar plus activate it, and uh, that uh, take the CO2, because when we make the movie, we find the way you you burn the, the, uh, see the wood, the, you can see the effect of toroide, the toroide effect of that the, the el humo, ¿cómo se dice humo? Smoke. The smoke goes up and goes back and goes inside. Mm -hmm. So after uh, the, the, all that, you, you don't allow the CO2 to go in the atmosphere. The atmosphere. You don't allow that. See, when you use it, the trees, they are only almacen, almacen, store the CO2. And when you, something happened to the wood, all that goes in the atmosphere. Yeah. So I think it will be very good to use it, the biochar. This is one question for you. 
And I have another for you, but I I was oh, no, or for you, whatever. The, the, now, bueno, the sí. other is, okay. uh, the, it's impossible to have the nutrients when you don't go to the root. Root, R-O-O-T, root. The, because when you use a dairy besides like glyphosate, uh, glyphosate, or how do you say it? The main reason how it works is because it takes the minerals from the proteins. So you are growing proteins without the center that is a mineral. And when it goes to the body, the problem is doesn't work, doesn't work. So this uh, lady from MIT mm -hmm. in, uh, two years ago in Holanda in the uh, trial for, against Monsanto, mm -hmm. she showed that the big problem with the, these kids that uh, has the, what is the name? Autism. Si. Uh, it's because they don't have manganeso because they mm -hmm. use it herbicides. So it's very, very important to be sure they don't use it, the herbicide. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so with the biochar, I think it has great potential. I haven't worked with it very much. I feel like uh, it's really critical to know what your biochar is made from, what feedstock, or to make your own. Uh, the process of making it without releasing the CO2 involves very low oxygen levels. And then unactivated biochar is great for filtering water, filtering dirty water. That unactivated biochar picks up all those pollutants. Um, but activated biochar is what you want to get into the soil in order to sustain crops and bring that carbon into the soil and hold onto water. So it has a lot of potential, but lots of things to think about. Um, nutrient deficiency and, and disease in our food system, it, like, like she mentioned, is due to chemical agriculture that kills the soil microbiota that is responsible for mineralizing the nutrients from the parent material in our soil. Um, and that's one of the, the main reasons. As she indicated, um, glyphosate functions as it breaks apart the enzymes in um, the, the cells, which breaks down metabolic function, and that's how it kills our plants. So if you are made of cells, glyphosate is bad for you. Um, and as, as she mentioned, autism is definitely linked to um, manganese and a whole host of other um, nutrients as, as, all, uh, as are all of our diseases, be it lifestyle or otherwise. Um, and if we can create a healthy system to grow our food in, we will create a healthy environment and a healthy population. Ergo, everything's connected. <laughs>